<clears throat> the following interview was conducted with Dale W. Marjorie and Harvey Washington Wiley, Distinguished Professor of Chemistry Emeritus for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Friday, October 2nd, 2009 in the television studio. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Good afternoon, Dr. Marjorie. Good Welcome. afternoon. <laughs> Welcome. Let's start with, tell us where you were born and your parents and early All years. All right, well, I was born in, in St. Louis, Missouri, and uh, I have a twin brother. And, Are you uh, identical or fraternal? Fraternal. Okay. And uh, but we were we looked very much alike, and uh, the um, I went I didn't grow up in St. Louis, but in one of the uh, suburbs of St. Louis, a small suburb called Ferguson. Okay. And about five thousand people. And uh, uh, that's where I went to. Uh, Did to you go high to grade school. school and high school there? Grade school and high school. Okay. Right. Tell us a little about high school. Any. Well, your course of study and any students? Well, a couple of things about about high school there right. might be of, might be of interest. The grade Good. schools were very crowded, Lot so they 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 in order to make room, they kept on taking the more advanced students and pushing them up a half a grade, and uh, that, that was kind of tough. But uh, that happened twice with my brother and I. So I graduated from high school at age sixteen as a result of of that. Change. Those leaps that you those had. leaps that we had, right? <laughs> <laughs> and but academically, there was no problem. I mean, it was sure able to handle that. It was a um, it was a good school, and the teachers were uh, uh, quite uh, strong in their subjects. That's interesting because I think a few years later that might not have been true. Mm -hmm. But this was uh, uh, graduated in four, in the forties. And they were they were very, uh, very dedicated. Right, and the program was pretty strong. Too. And the program was was strong, right? Right. Yeah. We didn't. I didn't realize uh, that it was as strong as it was till I got to college and found out that we sure. already had a lot of this stuff. <laughs> That's right. Right. But anyhow, we graduated uh, in in 1946 from high school. Okay. In 1946, the war ended, the World War II ended in 1945, the summer of 1945, but all of the returning veterans didn't really hit the universities until 46. Right. And so when, uh, when I started uh, at Southeast Missouri... How did you happen to select that uh, school? That's an interesting question. Good. We had no intention of going to Southeast Missouri. <laughs> we were going to but go. But had you decided that wherever you went, you'd both go to the same school? Well, we oh. at that, up till that point, we'd been pretty close to, you know, same curriculum. Sure. We were both chemistry majors, so. and um, uh, the, uh, but we had several pri private schools had been courting us to try because our grades were good to try to get us to come. Then all the returning veterans came, and none of those schools were interested in this anymore. They had paying, <laughs> they had paying students sure. from the from the federal government. Right, the GI Bill. The GI Bill, right. So um, uh, we had to we had to hurry up and find a place that would be still have places. We were not allowed, from my mother's point of view, to go to University of Missouri. Not that she had anything against the University of Missouri, but because our older brother, who just got back from the Navy, was going there, and she thought he had been too wild as an undergraduate student. So, so she didn't want him to influence us. <laughs> Actually, by that time, he was a very studious. Uh, <laughs> He'd had a leveling off. <laughs> right. So anyhow, uh, some people we knew had gone to Cape Girardeau. That's where Southeast Missouri sure. is. And so we, uh, we, went, we decided to go there. Okay. We got admitted easily, and uh, so we, we we went to school there. But there's a little matter of ma of money. Uh, uh, my mother had had two very very expensive operations, and uh, my father had no more money, so we were, were on our own as far as pay, paying for school. So the summer before we went. I decided I'm going to have to get a job in St. Louis that pays a little more than cutting grass and doing playground supervision. Right. So I marched through all the streets in downtown St. Louis, and I, I, I reached International Shoe Company. It's about a building about 12 stories high, and uh, they, they needed somebody, and it was office work, pretty routine. 
But you had to see that you had to tell them you were not just a summer employee. All right. So I lied. I needed a job. <laughs> right. right. I needed a job. Right. I've been walking right. the streets. Right. Street you know, I, who knew I could change my mind, you know. That's right. <laughs> So I, I worked for the International Shoe Company, and it was an office job, and at that, some of the new duplicating things were new at that time, and, and they were not very complicated, but I mean, I was in charge of one of them. And, but the other thing that was interesting about that place is that the, we had a... That was a big operation in St. Louis. Oh, that was a, a big, big company. A big operation, right, and in, throughout Missouri. That's right. And, uh, but there were two buildings, our building was the office building, and then right next door, uh, equal in size, was the manufacturing. So they actually manufactured shoes there. Yeah. And um, anyhow, one of my jobs was to take what I had been run off in, in my uh, duplicating machine and take what they call strips and uh, deliver them at various places in the manufacturing process so they would know what what steps to take, because they put these in front of them and they would check them off. So sure. the shoes were running down a line. Well, that was, uh, when I got, when I did this about for, for about two weeks, and uh, I noticed that the guy that got them always threw half of them away. You know, I worked hard to make 20 copies, and because that's what my boss said we had to have. Uh -huh. <laughs> And here they were throwing half away each time. So I asked him about them. He said, oh, he said, what happens is that everybody that orders one of these asks for an extra copy. And they do it all the way along the line. So by the time we start, we got all these extra copies. So I just threw them away to start with. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, I, I came back and, and told my boss that. And uh, he was very impressed that I would bother to get back to him on that. So, I mean, you know. <laughs> I'm pretty astute, right? <laughs> It increased our, our productivity, and uh, so. But that was interesting. It was a very different environment in the uh, manufacturing end and the office end, and particularly. Did you get any samples to bring home? Well, I, I for a long time I bought international shoes. <laughs> okay. But at the end of the uh, summer, I had to I had to go in and tell him I was I was leaving to go to college, and I thought he'd be really upset. And he was not. He said, great. You know, I wondered why you're wasting your time here. Uh, he said, where are you going to go? And I told him what we had in mind. He said, I think, I, do you need a job there? Because he knew I did. And I said, yes. And he said, maybe I can help you. He said, I don't think the factory would have any jobs, but I know the name of the supervisor of the plant, or the, whatever they call them, the head of the plant. And he said, I'll give you a letter of introduction, which he did. So I looked him up. It turned out he lived only about four blocks away from the campus where we were going to school. And so my brother and I both went over to see him, and he immediately cut Dave out. He said, I can do it for one, I can't do it for two. And, uh, but he gave me an introduction, and what he did was to suggest that I knew a lot about shoes and their manufacture and, and how they're made, and that's true, I did. And he said, you know, we have a lot, we sell a lot of our shoes to J.C. Penny and in, in Cape Girardeau, and uh, I think they would be glad to have a, a new shoe salesman who knows something about the product. Sure. So uh, that worked, and uh, I, sp I earned my way through the first year of college, the first half year at least, by uh, uh, selling shoes from 9 in the morning till 9 at night on every Saturday, uh, two hours, one hour off for lunch, one hour off for supper. And I learned a great deal about the people of, from Southeast Missouri. Yeah. You had to size them up when they came in. When they said they wanted shoes, you had to look them over. Because they might want shoes with uh, high, high top shoes, uh, work shoes. And they might want dress shoes. But they didn't call them that. They just called them shoes, you know. <laughs> if, you, if you picked the wrong kind, you were in trouble. Right? You were in the men's shoe department? This is the men's shoe department, okay. right. All right. And I found out after I got there, I mean, I was enjoying it, and I found out after I got there, a couple of the other guys who were working on commission, I didn't know that when I started, yeah. said, kind of ease up, you know, <laughs> we're, we're working on commission, you're not. So <laughs> anyhow, that, that worked out very well, and for, I did that job for two, two years. 
Uh, and it was nice. It was close to campus. It was within a bus ride to sure. campus, and yeah, so it was. And you learned a lot about the the people there. Oh yeah. And uh, well, then uh, we had intended to go to uh, Rolla School of Mines because that had a very strong uh, chemical engineering program. But by this time, we had both decided that we, we don't really want to do the engineering part as much as the chemistry part. So we decided to stay at, at, at Cape Girardeau. And uh, my brother, by the way, was coming back to St. Louis in the summers and, and, and uh, earning enough money to pay his way. Sure. And he had a good job with the Rexall Drug Company. Mm -hmm. But uh, I, was, I stayed on, on campus at, at Southeast Missouri in Cape Girardeau for all four years because I had, I, oh, I didn't tell you the rest of it. At the end of my freshman year, now I'm 17. And we have all of these returning vets who are on, on the average 10 years older. They range from 8 years older to sure. 15 years older. And, but they had nobody to instruct them, particularly in the laboratories. So I w they asked me if I would be willing to, uh, uh, to help teach the labs that, that summer. And if, I, if it worked out all right, maybe I could have the job in the fall, too. So in fact, that's what happened. Uh, and uh, so I was telling people how to do the lab experiments and everything. And, you know, I was just a kid, and, and they were you know, returning veterans from, from all over the Europe and Asia and everything. And, but they were, they were fine with me. And um, They were eager to learn. They were eager to learn. Right, to they were having... I mean, they had been out of school for a long time, so right. it was hard. Right, so they were struggling. Right, and so that was uh, that was anyhow. To make a long story short, at Cape Girardeau, every time I finished one course, I would teach the lab in the course the next next mm -hmm. year because you were familiar with. I it. was familiar with it, and they right. and they were desperately short of people. They tried to find me. I mean, they weren't just shoving it off on on me. They were. They just couldn't find anybody. So, and then my brother did too after a couple of years, and uh, so we had a we had a good time at, at Cape Girardeau, and and they right. gave me a they gave me my own. <laughs> we had a, an old chemistry building, at there, and uh, in the basement of that chemistry building, behind a cage, there was a lab, and. Uh, I don't know how it got set up, but there was a very nice lab well, to a, an undergraduate student, and they said, "This is yours if you want it, and if you need any glassware, it's in the cage." You know. So, I mean, I was in seventh heaven. I had oh everything I needed. You to really like experiments from you know. shoes to my own right, lab. Right. <laughs> what could be better? <laughs> right. So. Uh, it's a leap forward. Yeah. So that was. Uh, that was. Uh, that was interesting. All right. Did yeah. you and your brother uh, room together in a? We roomed together the first year. Okay. In, a, in a dorm? In the dorm. Okay. And uh, we didn't get into the dorm until halfway through the year. It was really crowded. Sure. But then uh, after that, uh, I was going every semester, and he was, only, he was coming back the regular academic year, so it didn't match up too well. And uh, besides, we wanted to try other roommates. Sure. And uh, so I had some really crazy roommates. <laughs> I, I, after our senior year, I decided he was a pretty good roommate. <laughs> so we got together in a senior year again. Okay, yeah. sounds good. Yeah. And uh, then uh, we had a, a couple of profs there who were very, uh, very helpful and very interested in, in our interest in chemistry and wanting to do graduate You're, work. In were you both in chemistry? We were both in chemistry, right. Okay. And so uh, I decided I wanted to go to Iowa State, and that's because they had the Ames Lab. Ames Lab is an Atomic Energy Commission lab, but at that time, Atomic Energy Commission was a was a good. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> it was oh, yeah. very. Anyhow, they had they had wonderful equipment and and, and well paying. I didn't do any teaching anymore. Just, I just did just did research. Just did research, right? But I got paid for for the the part I got paid for that couldn't go into my thesis, but it was you know it was separated. And. Um, so I, uh, I enjoyed that. And uh, the best thing that happened, though, at Ames was after I was there for two years. Well, Dave went to, uh, Dave went to, to uh, North, Northwestern. 
So he also had a good, a good position and, and enjoyed it. Oh, one other story I got to tell you. We had no money. Was there any financial assistance available at that time whatsoever or? Uh, right. Except when I got paid as a graduate student. Okay. Uh, no. It was hard even at undergrad. Time. Right. No, I didn't yeah. get any, any as an undergrad. Sure. Time. And uh, it, I'm sure that schools had such it money. It would but, vary, though, and you don't hear so much about right, it during those times. Right. You know. Well, the country was still. That's right. Still poor. That's right. Exactly. Right. And um, anyhow, I was very glad to have a job. Oh yeah. And but uh, then I, I was working both at J C Penney's and and at the lab doing the lab during the week and right. it was getting pretty busy. That's right. And I decided maybe I could give up the J C Penney job because I had been taking uh, draftsman drafting courses and they needed a draftsman a half time draftsman at, at at Southeast Missouri Utility Company and the, the guy who had been doing it told me about it. And he said, I think you'd, you'd do a good job for him. So I, I did that for my last two years. Oh, good. And that hours, I could do any hours I wanted. Sure. It was very nice. Perfect. Right. right. So that was good. And uh, so then I um, uh, did accept the position at Ames. And the best thing that had me at Ames was after, uh, after a couple of years, uh, Sonia came there from from Cape, from uh, uh, Saint Olaf, Saint Olaf College, so she was starting to work in the lab as a laboratory technician uh, with a B.S. degree in chemistry, uh, and uh, of course I was there working, and I had a B.S. degree in chemistry, and I had two years' experience in graduate school, and so we uh, that's where we met, literally over the test tubes, you know. <laughs> <laughs> that's very good. <laughs> That's the highlight. Yeah, yeah. Well, that was good. That yeah. was good. That 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 worked out very well uh, for both of did us. Did you like at Ohio State at Iowa State? Yes, good. very good. We were, we lived in the. Um, you got married while you were there. We got married while we were there. Uh -huh. we got married after. Well, uh, that's another part of the story. Uh, without going into too much detail, my father had been working at William Moore Warner and Company in St. Louis. He was a chemist. He did not like chemistry. But he knew he was a very good bench chemist. He was really mad when we decided to go into chemistry. <laughs> he didn't think it was a good profession at all, and uh, it was from his own experience. Right. But you know he put up with it, and of course his trouble was he only had had two years of college. He was had college in at, uh, in the east, and he got to two years, and then he got went into the army for World War One. So uh, anyhow, I, after, two, after I'd been there for two years, he wrote and told me that, that his job was being terminated at, uh, at the company he was at, which was, was his William R. Warner and Company, and uh, that he was, would be looking for a job. Now that really panicked me because uh, I didn't know that he could get a job. And my mother was uh, partially paralyzed, and I, I, so I told my my major professor immediately. I said, "I need a full time position uh, for next year," uh, and so he gave it to me. So I got a full time position at, at Ames Lab, and that meant I could only take a few courses. Sure. Uh, so my PhD study was slowed down. Uh, but I, my lab, I had the same type of lab. In fact, I turned out two research papers at that time, but they didn't count to my thesis yeah. <laughs> because I was being paid full time. Sure. Well, my my father got a got a fine position with another with Rexall Drug Company, and that was there was no problem. But Good. I never actually told him that I had made that switch. Sure. But that it was all a, worked out. It was okay. a back out, back yeah, up. Yeah. Sure. So um, yeah, we. Ames is a very friendly community, and uh, both Sonia and I liked it very much. And uh, so I was working with Charles Banks, who was uh, 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 very friendly, but a superb professor. And there was a group, the research group, 
that he had had about 20 people all together because 10 of them were employed full time by the, or half time by the Ames lab. So he had this dual responsibility for the graduate students and for the routine for the work lab. in the Ames lab. Yeah. But I had to do things in the Ames lab which were a little more advanced than most of the graduate students would. I mean, I was in charge of the purity of the thorium metal that we produced. And I, we had to test this regularly and, and so forth. Anyhow, uh, the, uh, I decided that I really wanted to teach. Nobody was looking for teaching positions at that time. And that's interesting. This was, this yeah. was now 1954. Yeah, I think I, I got my ears right here. No, they're not looking. That's interesting. Uh, well, the, the industrial demand was tremendous. Yeah. You almost had to have a postdoc to get a teaching position. And, um, you know, your teaching positions came through the, the, the more prestigious universities. But and there was limit, in other words, they were limited in number and selective. And they didn't advertise. So you, may, you had no idea that there was a position open someplace. Sure. Right? They didn't advertise. So, um, but I, I knew I wanted to, so I, anyhow, I, I interviewed for industrial positions. I had, I had, I took, I think, 12 trips. I had 10 offers. Sonia went with me on one of those trips, or maybe two of those trips. Uh, the offers were very good. Oh, yeah. was, they were nice. Oh, yeah. you know, one in particular that wouldn't give up uh, on me was uh, the... Uh, uh, just a second. We had a couple of them that wouldn't give up. But anyhow, the one I'm thinking of was, is Procter & Gamble. Procter & Gamble was really wanted me to come there. At any rate, all of a sudden, um, I got a call from E.T. McBee, who was head of the chemistry department at Purdue. And he said, I understand you might be interested in a teaching position. And I said, yes, I am. Well, I can offer you one. And he started to make me an offer over the phone. And I said, well, I've just been back from all these industrial interviews, and, and I have a number of offers from them, and I know that my imp impression of what the place is like is often very different than what it is actually like, and the visits are terribly important. So I said, I won't consider it without a visit. Well, he didn't, he didn't think I'd say that. He just thought I'd say, okay. <laughs> He just wanted someone who could come in temporarily and they'd hire and then fire, you know. But as a result of my saying that, he said, well, all right, we'll see if we can arrange a, an interview for you. So, so I had an interview with, you know, I, people like H. Herb Brown and others were, sure. uh, were there at my interview. Did you take the train or you, how'd you come? I drove. Oh, okay. Drove. okay. Well, <laughs> I had one industrial interview left. And, and uh, that was fortunate because it was when uh, it was at, at in the, uh, what's the company that's moved used to be in Indiana and, not, and then moved anyhow uh, on the on the lake of Lake Shore of Michigan. So uh, I went there first and then I came to to Purdue. And that way it didn't cost sure. them as much. Right. All right. They were really tight fisted. But uh, it didn't matter much what, what uh, my reactions with, with E.T. McBee, unless I actually insulted him, which I didn't. Uh, what mattered was what the rest of the faculty thought about me. And to my surprise, they were very enthusiastic. So uh, I, I got the job, and, and I got a, a three-year offer, not a, not a not a one-year offer, but a three-year offer. So I knew, but I, I, so I said I would accept, but he wanted me to come in the fall of 1950. Is that right? 50, yeah. 
And I said, my thesis won't be finished. And he said, well, will you have your data collected? I said, well, I, I, not unless I collect it at three times the pace I'm doing now. He said, let me talk to Charlie. So he talked to Charles Banks. And he lined up three, uh, he, I'd already published several research papers, but they didn't count for my thesis because I was working full time. So he, he lined up the uh, three people to help me collect data. And it was, it was a kinetics problem. Now, I had a, an advantage and a disadvantage with the kinetics problem. I was very interested in it. Charles Banks, very good chemist, but he knew nothing about kinetics whatsoever. So I was completely on my own. There was another professor there who I could go to for help. He was very, very helpful. But anyhow, I ended up, I would never have done this to any of my students, but I ended up with a massive amount of data collected. And Charlie, I mean, so E.T. McBee said, well, you know, we're, you're gonna be working in an, in an area where we're still waiting for the labs to be finished. That's when Weatherall was, was being built. The labs weren't finished yet. So we didn't, have, we didn't have all the research labs available. They had dedicated the Weatherall the spring after I arrived. 55. Right, right. <laughs> so, so that was the excuse. I mean, since they didn't, the lab wasn't actually available, I could go ahead and work now and let's see. So I, uh, I wanted very much to go into academics. Otherwise, otherwise, I would not have taken it. I had money offers from industrial positions. We're, we're paying 50% uh, more. Oh, yeah. And Sonia also wanted to come to an academic location. So that's how we got here. And that first year was horrible. <laughs> In what fashion? Well, because I was teaching for the first mm -hmm. time. I had a, a teaching Getting load. Getting adjusted. The teaching load was twice what it is now for beginning people. Uh, and uh, and I, had, I had to do all this workup of my data. And it, you know, if you knew exactly what was gonna happen, you wouldn't have had to do the experiments. I didn't know exactly what was gonna happen. Sure. And the result is the interpretation of the experiments uh, took a while. Right. And <laughs> so the first year was really tough. And Sonia was very, <laughs> very under, now, oh, she was working also in the labs. She, in the chemistry department? In the chemistry department, because she was you know, a highly qualified sure. chemist, and, and she worked with, uh, uh, with Mrs. Ye, Dr. Ye, in the microanalytical laboratories. And that is really routine work. And <laughs> she, she grew to love Dr. Ye, very nice. We had good relations with him all the time, but she hated the job. <laughs> so, so that was a tough year for her. Sure. All right. Where'd you live when you came here? Well, we lived on 404 Wood Street. 404 Wood Street, we lived exactly opposite where the new uh, uh, center uh, is, uh, what do they call it? The, where they do interviewing and so forth. Oh, Center for Career. Oh, Dosh Center? You mean Dosh, yeah, right, Dosh Center, right. Okay. Right. We lived across the street from them. Sure, okay. We lived in an old two-story house and uh, it was, uh, our apartment was on the upstairs. We had a five room upstairs apartment. And uh, the apartment downstairs was again five rooms. Big old house, terrible to heat. <laughs> and was coal fired. <laughs> they had two furnaces. So the, uh, the job of, uh, if anybody moved in, your job was to teach them how to, how to run their furnace. <laughs> Uh, Anyhow, that was, a, that was an interesting experience. At that time, now that's a change. Many of the faculty lived south of, uh, of State Street. We were, this was uh, uh, a lot of faculty lived in that area. Okay. And the more older faculty uh, lived, still lived in West Lafayette, not like it is now where they're living all over elsewhere. But they, they, they lived... Uh, within a few blocks of campus, many okay. of them. In areas that well, nobody will live in now because there's too many students. I understand. But <coughs> there were more houses in, the facilities were different then. Yeah, right. right. Well, housing. the size of the university was much different. Right, right. oh yeah. Right. But anyhow, the, uh, the Purdue faculty 
uh, were very kind to me. I mean, I was really an upstart. I, had, I was only 20 years old. Is that right? I think oh, I may have missed my ages now. I was, okay. yeah. <laughs> anyhow, 24 oh, years old. But a lot younger than... 24. I was younger than everybody. Anybody else come the same time that you did? Um, not precisely. Okay, somebody no. else. Right, right. right. And Dr. McBee was the head. Dr. McBee was head, right. And so it's interesting, of course, because eventually I became head of chemistry. Mm. And uh, I knew a lot of the problems <laughs> from my own experience. And that, that stood me in good stead. Right. But, Talk a little bit about your research that uh, you got and what you carried forward then. And the well, I was, I, was still, I was still very interested in, in um, I got interested in the kinetic studies in my, uh, doing my PhD thesis. And I was still interested in the, in the uh, use of, of, uh, of uh, methods of speed of reactions as opposed, as not only just to study the, the system, but also to, for chemical analysis. Right. So I, um, I did a lot of research in that area, and it was a pretty new area. Uh, and the uh, one of the things, uh, fortunate things that happened to me is that um, I um, went to a meeting in Chicago, Northwestern. Now, Dave, my brother had gone from Northwestern by then, but I went to this meeting, and and uh, uh, I, I had was had been asked to speak. And it was the uh, first time I'd spoken, uh, you know, at a, this was a bigger group that I had addressed before. And uh, one of the other last minute additions to the program uh, was, uh, uh, gave, a, gave a talk too. He was not on, officially on the program, but they, they, mm -hmm. they, they added, added him to the program. Well, uh, he gave a wonderful talk. But I, I, I talked to him afterwards. He had heard my talk, and I talked to him afterwards. And, and uh, we got into an argument about, about some aspect of, of the work. Well, uh, he, uh, we went over to the Northwestern Library to settle the argument. And uh, we, we, we were both very happy about what happened, because we both felt we had won after we settled the argument. <laughs> so, Interesting. Anyhow, this man's name was Manfred Eigen. And Eigen uh, won the Nobel Prize in chemistry a few years after that. But in the meantime, before that, he asked me to, to come study with him. And I said, yeah, I would love to. I got, we have a, a, another child on the way, <laughs> but as soon as, as soon as we get through that period, we'd love to come. So I, t I took a sub my first sabbatical that was available. Uh, Sonia and I and, and, and two little kids uh, went to uh, uh, Germany, in Göttingen, Germany, and uh, I worked with the Max Planck Institute. I saw that. On the yeah, yeah, right. And that was, uh, that was a, he was attracting people from all over the world. He was a wonderful guy. And he, uh, he believed that the people in, in chemistry should be broader in their interests than just chemistry. So he had all kinds of special things <laughs> uh, that he was involved with. And, and uh, some of the people thought this was kind of nonsense, you know, but I, Sonia and I really liked it. So, and he would, he would take us out on weekends and show us all around Germany. And uh, we, he was a, he was a great, go ahead. He was a great, a great enthusiast. So that uh, that was a very productive period. Uh, we were only here for, uh, I mean, we were only there for eight months, but it was a wonderful period. Very for you. Yes, right. And it and it reinforced things that I thought I ought to be doing, and uh, and he was very supportive. And from then on, uh, you know, he would make sure I got invited to uh, major international meetings, and whether they were in Israel or in Italy or wherever. And uh, that, that, of course, was exciting. Very good. And I was recruiting graduate students like mad to work in my research group. Right. Because, oh, I didn't mention that, but 
When I started, there was no, no direct support for chemical research from the government. That didn't come until later. And um, uh, Sputnik is what brought that on. After Sputnik, uh, our, our government realized we were way behind. Yeah. A lot of changes came about. Right. And so all of a sudden, uh, money was available. I mean, there had been a limited amount of money available, but only in very narrow areas. Now it was a much more broadly available. And so I remember, I realized things had drastically changed. I had applied and gotten some small grants, but none of them from the big, I mean, National Institutes of Health didn't exist. All right. I had much better equipment when I was a graduate student at Iowa State because they were being supported by the Atomic Energy Commission than I was at Purdue. Mm -hmm. Anyhow, the, uh, that all broke through, when, and, and I realized things had really changed when they had visitors from the Air Force Office of Scientific Research came to Purdue, and they walked into my office and said, what are you doing in research? So I explained what I was doing and why. Can you write that up in two pages and give us a budget? I said, yes, okay. You're on. <laughs> so, oh, wow. <laughs> I'd love something like that. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> Things were more difficult after that. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, so I, anyhow, I had an excellent group of graduate students that worked with me. And the, the, uh, the group got as large as 20 or so. And uh, both Sonia and I enjoyed Interacting. Interacting with yeah. them. Do you want to talk a little about the, when you were the head of the department? Yeah, when I was head of the department. Um, were you appointed by, how did that appointment come about? Through the dean or? Uh, chemistry was insistent on, on after, uh, I don't know if you know, that Earl McBee was thrown out by the, by, the, oh. by the faculty, well, indirectly. And A change was made. A change was made, right. And the, the dean was, uh, was, was sympathetic to the, the, what the faculty wanted. And uh, immediately after, uh, I was not immediately after him. Uh, uh, Joe Foster was. But they, uh, they, needed, a, they needed somebody to, to, to run the place. And, and um, uh, Joe Foster had been head, and then Bob Bencaster, I don't know if you know these names or not. Right. And, and, and then me. Uh, and I, I did was, interview with Dr. Ben Casey. What's that? I have interviewed Ben Casey. Yeah, I did. Right. right. Okay. Yeah, excellent, excellent guy. I just talked to him the other day. Mm -hmm. uh, excellent guy. And uh, well, uh, I had a big research group. Oh. I had one of the biggest research groups, and I, and I didn't know if I had time to do the, the headship business. So although I was first, I really wanted to do it, I, then I realized I really didn't think I could do it. And I tried to back out of it, but they pushed a lot. Pushed a lot. The faculty were very supportive, and and they stayed supportive all the time. I was head, with one or two exceptions. And there was one crazy guy who was here. It was named Fong. He's still in town. And he uh, he uh, he was uh, he was really crazy. Uh, but he was very, he was brilliant, but brilliantly crazy. And so he, uh, I was not directly, that happened after I was head, but it was going on while I was head. He actually, actually got a vote of the, uh, a special committee was formed, not just of chemistry, in fact, no chemists were allowed to be on it from across the, the whole school uh, to consider whether he should be, he should, tenure should be taken away from him. And uh, it was by a most unanimous vote. And uh, he really had gone all, all, all crazy. Uh, but we know when a guy is brilliant and crazy, you don't know quite what to, what to right. do about it. Right? Very so, touchy. Yeah. Right. yeah. So those were tough times. Yeah. As, yeah. As, as, as How was the uh, enrollment? Did that increase over time when you were? Oh, there? yes. Yeah. And the grad as well as the graduate undergrad? Graduate students and undergraduates uh, okay. kept increasing. Right? Right. Okay. And our facilities were had improved a lot. Right. Yeah. 
from the time I, well, after I came, when I first came, Weatherall was just being finished. All right. Then we built the Brown Building, All right. which wasn't named the Brown Building until after you got the Nobel Prize. Right. But uh, then uh, we had much more expanded facilities, but they were, then we had to add a, finish the last floor of the Brown Building, the fifth right. floor. Speaking of that, make a comment on Dr. Brown. You were here when he got the... Oh, I, oh yeah, I was here when he got the... Do you remember there was a picture that I saw, Dr. Marjorie, where the students put that flag or a drape outside the window, and I remember seeing it, but I've n I remember looking out and seeing it because I could look from Stewart Center, and I yeah. remember seeing that. Right. They, oh, they yeah. did do that. Am I correct in that? Oh, yeah, that's okay. right. Right. In fact, we the whole the faculty and students all went to the airport when he flew in, and and uh, I forget how we found out about uh, about it. He he knew before he got here, didn't he? Somebody tell him. I forget now. <laughs> well, yeah. Uh, anyhow, we were there. This was sure. really welcoming him back from from having gotten the prize when the announcement came out. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so, uh, yeah, he was. Uh, he was away on a trip or something. I think. No, he. Had, he? Oh. That, the reception that I'm talking about oh. was after he had actually been given the. Ah, oh, when right. he came back from right. that. That's nice. Right. Yeah. Right. 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 Yeah. right. Yeah. And you had interacted with him for a long period of time. Oh yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. So we were good friends. Right. Uh, Herb was, you know, really t very, very strongly involved in his research, and he wasn't doing right. social things very much and everything. But right. Yeah. Sarah was, and so we were friends with both of them. Good relationship. Yeah, right, right. Yeah. Well, then, how about the, you know, how about the uh, Margarine Research Lab? Was, how was that set up? Did someone, I mean, you have a name on that. Am I correct in that? Well, uh, or just just referred because of the students that you had? Yeah, okay. right, right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I had up to uh, um, over 20 graduate students at one time. Okay. And I saw the pictures of the canoe trip. Yeah, Which, oh, you did? How did you see those? I was on the Google. I happened to see oh, that. I, I see, pulled yeah. that up. I, oh, wow. Uh, <laughs> Not for me, Lord. <laughs> <laughs> no, that was, was one nice. thing we did. Uh, That's nice that I was did very interested the in, in, the, in the canoeing, and, and uh, uh, there are some good Indiana streams to sure. canoe in, and Sugar Creek happens to be one, pretty good one. Right. And so, yeah, we every, every year we'd go on a canoe trip, and, and the... Uh, Spent a whole day going as far as we could, and 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 there were always people who had never been canoeing, because there were a turnover of graduates. Sure, students. right. Yeah. It was exciting. It was a nice idea yeah. to do then. Uh, let's see. Um, then you also were the research director for Purdue students pursuing the doctoral and masters. Was that while you were the head or afterwards? Oh, that was all the time I was. Oh, okay, yeah. okay, right, right, okay. And you've done some consulting. Let's talk a little bit about your awards and honors. Certainly, we'll start with the distinguished professorship of the Harvey Washington. Harvey Washington Harvey Wiley, Wiley, yeah. Yes. How did yeah. that come about? Did you well, know? Well, this uh, the name. And how did you select? Did you select the I name? I selected the name actually. <laughs> they, I was given. I mean, they told me you, you're going to be you're going to be named a distinguished professor. Do you want to name it for somebody, or do you just want to just be called a distinguished professor? And I, I had done, a, I'd, as department head, I had realized that the importance... And he was local. Wiley was yeah, from here. Yeah, oh yeah, Wiley... A lot of people was, don't know that. This was before he became uh, the food and drug uh, That's right. czar. Right. That's right. 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 Oh, Wiley was a very interesting guy. He, well, he Because I've read some of the stuff we have in the archives. Very colorful. Oh, very colorful, right. In many ways. <laughs> <laughs> well, he was... Uh, yeah, people, some of the more uh, <laughs> laid back uh, faculty <laughs> didn't like him. Right. But he was, uh, yeah, he was good. Mm -hmm. He he recruited uh, people and, and, and uh, he was very interactive with the, with the students. All right, exactly, including right. the bicycle as well. Yes, uh, his, his <laughs> famous bicycle, right. which I don't know if it's... We don't, people don't know what ever happened to it. It seems to have either. disappeared. This no. was one of these with the great big back wheel and a little front wheel. <laughs> <don't know>. Right. <laughs> uh, uh, no, he was, he was an interesting man. Yeah. And he, he just, he was so upset by the, what was happening in the, in the uh, fraudulent drugs being made and sold. Right. And uh, he, that was what started them because he, right. people were asking him to analyze what was in these things and so forth. And, right. and he was, uh, the people that were doing it were hated him because he really got the government to clamp down on him. Right. Right. But that was a nice, that was a good choice. And yeah. I, I, was something I read said, what always interests me in reactions are what the main pathways are and where the catalysts are. 
That was, yeah, yeah. right. That was my, my main, my main nice. interest in I think another thing is, that's interesting is that your Alumni Merit Award, both you and your brother got it from the Southeast. Southeast Missouri, yeah. Yes, right. that's very nice. Yeah, that was good. It was a surprise. And we went, both went back to, to Cape Girardeau. Where did your brother take, uh, is he, did he go into teaching as well? No, he went from... Um, so you, did you receive your degrees, PhD, about the same time? or? Uh, mine was a little earlier than oh, his, okay. but just a little bit. Uh, he, he finished at Northwestern about the same time I came to Purdue. Okay. But uh, he, uh, well, that's not quite right, anyhow. But closer. Right? Because I had to hitchhike. I had no car. I used to hitchhike from Cape Girardeau to St. Louis and from and then from St. Louis, from Ames to St. Louis and from Ames to Evanston and so forth. That's interesting because people didn't hitchhike nowadays, but those days it was close enough to World War II that you were still helping the veterans. That's right, exactly. And I, I never had any trouble hitchhiking. Right, right. I, I have to amplify that, except the last time I did it. Uh, what, do you want to comment on that? Yeah, oh. I, I, I uh, one of, it was my, I'd been two years at, at, at Ames at that time, and uh, I, uh, one of my friends got a position out at, in Denver, and uh, at the Rocky uh, Flats. And he said, uh, I have to drive out, you want to come along? Have you never seen that area? And I said, oh, I'd love to. And he said, I don't know how you're going to get back, but I said, oh, that's no problem, I'll hitchhike back. So. It's exactly what happened. We had a good time out there, and I got my little suitcase with a sign on it and started hitchhiking. But I got word quickly that in Colorado, hitchhiking along the main highways was illegal. That was that didn't happen for very long, but it was true for a while. Sure. So, and you had to know the color of the of the state police car, and if you if one came, you had to get out of the way so they wouldn't pick you up. Right. Well, so that made hitchhiking a little more difficult. <laughs> <laughs> took a little longer. It took a little longer, but then I got a ride. It was a very long ride, but the guy dropped me off out in the boondocks. It was a big highway, but there was no, no crossroad. And uh, as I was hitchhiking unsuccessfully as the cars were going by at high speed, I began to eye this, the haystacks and see where I was going to sleep that night when a motorcycle pulled up. And he said, you want to ride? I said, oh yeah, but I, I've got a little suitcase and I, how am I going to get on your motorcycle? Put it between us, he said. So I had to hold one hand on the suitcase, press it against his back, and he said, oh, it was fine. And the other hand uh, to hang on the side of this motor. I'd never been on a motorcycle before. <laughs> it about killed my interest in motorcycles. <laughs> <laughs> my first and only shot, yeah. right? <laughs> he went as fast as he possibly could to impress me, and, and uh, the first song of any size in Nebraska that he came to, I got off and <laughs> got a bus. <laughs> right. yeah, uh, and you got uh, the Sigma Psi Award for Outstanding Research and the Sagamore of the Wabash. It's another one. You yeah. got quite a few. Yeah. How did the Sagamore come, did come about? Were you a little bit surprised, or uh, did they let you know? Actually, uh, I don't know how it came about. Okay. So was I, it yes, a, I was did, surprised. Well, where did they present it? Was it an event, or it was presented at, at one of the uh, at one of the meetings here? Yeah, it wasn't. I didn't go to some place to get it. They presented it at Purdue. That's yeah. nice. Yeah. What uh, after you stepped down as the head, then you continued on your research, and then, did you go on on half time and? Are you now completely retired? I'm completely retired now, okay. yeah. Only, I only went on half-time the last four years. Oh, okay, yeah. okay. Yeah. And now you're, so, what are your um, post-Purdue activities? Well, uh, I'm still not completely out of my office. But well, that's all right. <laughs> that's, a, that's a good sign. <laughs> but uh, the, uh, I've been active, got active in the uh, uh, Lafayette Symphony uh, organization, the one that runs it. I don't play any music. But I love to listen to it. Sure. And uh, so I was there. I was on their board for eight years. And um, then uh, more more recently, I've been on the board of the Long Center for Performing Arts. Good. And uh, they've they've got some major problems, and I've been trying to work on that. Right. And Two other awards I want to make a comment on was the Weatherall Medal from the Department of Chemistry and 
the Hubert Newbert McCoy Award. Yeah, those are the very M nice. McCoy Award is a, is done through the Science School. Sure, that's a very nice award. It's a very nice award. I agree. It was, right, and you have to give a major lecture right. for it. And, yeah, and yeah, it was very pleased. Very to good. Yeah. What about your your brother? Is he uh, is he still working? Uh, yeah. He, oh. Well, no. He's he's he's. What did he What did he end up doing? Well, he ended up working with uh, uh, he, he had several positions. But oh, he was, okay. first he was in in Massachusetts. Okay. And then he was uh, and then he went to uh, uh, work in private industry in California. Oh, okay. And he ended up uh, with a very nice position in in uh, uh, in California. Okay. But that that. The retirement doesn't is earlier than it is in academics, so he's been. Sometimes that I understand that occurs. Right. Yeah. yeah. Right. Um, and you, do you still keep active in your professional associations? Still go to any of the meetings? Or? I I have until this year. I, okay. I, I pretty well gave it up this year. Okay. I mean, I, I was last year. I went to several and spoke at some and so sure. forth. That's a lot of work too. So. Yeah, keep your finger yeah. in there. <laughs> How about uh, Purdue Tradition? You have one that you'd like to share with us? Purdue Traditions? Mm -hmm. Anything comes to mind? Um, well, there's a lot of great traditions, but I'm not sure which ones. <laughs> Take a couple. It doesn't have to be one. It's good to have a variety. Yeah. Um, well, before we start, you mentioned football. That's the athletics. Yeah. Well, of course, I'm, we still go to all the football sure. games, right? And uh, right. That's that's good. Uh, we used to go to the basketball games, but that now that's too much. Football. There are a lot. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. But we did for quite a few years. Sure. Right. Uh, now Sonia is an avid sports fan. Uh, uh, she can still diagnose a football play uh, much better than, than I can and much better than anybody around her. In fact, we, where we are sitting in the football stands, th there's a, a, a seat in front of us for about four people, and it seems to be always filled by people who are, who are uh, scouting the teams. I don't know why, but that's what it is. We, that's where they position it. That's them. where they, <laughs> so, and, and, so you know, we could just tell by their conversations that this, this is what they were doing they were scouting the team. Sure. And after one game, why one of the guys turned, turned to Sonia and said, "Lady, you really know your football," <laughs> because some of the comments she, she'd been making. So, it was good, so. All right. No, she's the football fan. Yeah. I enjoy it, but she she uh, she can see a lot more than I can see in the games. Yeah. But you share it. In, yeah, with, sure, sure. In which is sort of fun. How about uh, any others that? You like the Boilermaker special? That's kind of fun. Oh yeah, see around town. Oh yeah, and well, the tradition is that. you have to honk, and I always honk when they pass. And sometimes <laughs> people say, "Why are you honking?" I <laughs> yeah. said, "Because that's what you're supposed to do." <laughs> yeah, I yeah, know we've enjoyed all the all the Purdue traditions. Sure, it's a, right. it's a great school. Right. And, uh, How about an outstanding event? One of those? Anything comes to mind? I know you've had a lot. Oh, uh, well, uh, of course the Herb Brown's. Right. Nobel Prize was a was an exciting, outstanding event. It's the only one a, that a Purdue person has won. Right, right, right. And um, well, uh, I don't know. It's been been a lot. Right. I'm looking forward to uh, the an, an announcement yet to be made about a new chemistry building, but I think it's going to come. But we'll see. Keep our fingers yeah. crossed. Yeah. <laughs> I'll leave it. Any closing comments that you, uh, as you look back and look ahead, reflections? Uh, no, I, I, I was very pleased to be given the opportunity to, uh, to teach at Purdue. I have a, I have, I have some large number of graduate students. And you can still keep in touch. Yes. Good. Yes, and uh, they're very, very loyal. And they did a, I, I learned a lot from them, and I think they right. learned a lot from me. And some of them are in industry, and some of them are academic. But uh, that part of the of, of teaching these students, I think, uh, was much the thing I enjoyed most. Right. And that's where most of my time went too. Right. I agree. And that's good. Yeah. I want to thank you. This has been very nice. Well, thank you. My pleasure. Thank you, Dr. Right. Martin.